Camp, who I've known for a number of years since he was executive director of, of CNPS. He's now the executive director of the California Institute for Biodiversity. Uh, he has a PhD from UC Berkeley and previously worked in addition to CNPS as executive director of CalFlora and as director of habitat protection and restoration for Ottoman Canyon Ranch's 31 preserves. Not many people in this world get to re uh, rediscover a presumed extinct plant, but Dan is one of the few. Uh, in 2009, he discovered a presumed extinct Franciscan manzanita growing on a traffic island uh, right before the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, and you may have seen uh, some of the uh, video coverage of that. Uh, Dan was, was instrumental in working with Governor Brown to take on an ambitious statewide biodiversity initiative, and he continues to work with Governor Newsom on this. Uh, Dan is not only a scientist, but he's also passionately committed to preserving the remarkable biodiversity biodiver hotspot we call California. And it's with great pleasure that I turn this meeting over to Dan to talk about what he has great expertise uh, and passion about biodiversity. All right, I guess it's turned over. Uh, let me, let me, I guess before I load up my slides, I just want to say hi. Um, I see a bunch of familiar, familiar names, not yet faces, but hopefully we can all kind of get on camera at the end. I'm trying to do a fast talk um, because I'm sick of long Zoom talks, and you probably are too. And I'm also hoping that we can get some good conversations going. Um, so, hi everybody. Um, hi, Sherry Adams. I was just talking to Matthew Daniel check the other day. Anyway, um, okay. Doing the screen share. Can you all see that the the CIB logo? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. Good. Cool. And uh, forgive me, I'm squinting a little bit. I forgot my bifocals here today, so going to be mixing it up. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to come talk. Uh, really nice to connect. Um, uh, I get to work for the California Institute for Biodiversity, which just to make a little pitch, uh, was formed in 1995 for all of the usual reasons, to celebrate California's biodiversity, uh, save it, and, and to advance education and understanding across all, 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 you know, all, all domains uh, that are required with definitely an emphasis on research. And um, and I wanted to start first by, um, you know, talking a little bit about, you know, uh, I made a sort of a homecoming recently, took, took the family down and, and uh, drove down uh, the long way to Southern California, bringing my, my niece who grew up in Texas and um, in a school district where, you know, if they dye their hair, they get expelled from school. So very different environment and wanted to take a few weeks to show her California and show her kind of, you know, the family, the family stomping ground. And so we wound up down in Fallbrook, California, the town that I grew up in. And, um, and I went to, you know, the old places, um, went to Live Oak Park, which you can see here, which is a park that was preserved for the Live Oaks. Um, really a glorious place and a place that we used to hike to when we were kids. And we'd, 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 we'd hike there through oak forests and avocado orchards and, um, and then find ourselves at a nice shady creek uh, with oak trees buzzing with life. And with um, you know, with with really interesting lessons to be learned, and and here you can see obviously some acorn grinding stones uh, that that were part of basically part of my childhood, and um, and and really kind of helped helped me to kind of really connect with bio, not just biodiversity but but the richness of life that comes off of those oak trees and the human connection to it. And I would, you know, I would, it was pretty rural. And so I spent a lot of time reading and I would pour over my dad's old Yule Gibbons books and we would go out foraging. And so there was kind of a, you know, kind of a seamless connection uh, between appreciating all of the life that was around us and going out and getting some stuff. And my dad was, you know, the family doctor for the Guachinos. So basically kind of the, you know, kind of the family, kind of the general practitioner for Palaband of Mission Indians. And, it, and I realize now in hindsight that it was kind of a special, a special way to grow up and to, to really connect with biodiversity and to see the human connection in it and understand that, that it's seamless and that, that it's not just history, but, but it's an ongoing story and an ongoing evolution. And that yes, things are changing, but we're all part of it and we're all still here. Um, and, and we all have a role to play in it. 
you know, other formative things for me with regard to biodiversity, we're watching just how fast things can change and just how fast you can lose biodiversity. So this is this is the hill above Live Oak Park, uh, where you know very recently something happened that has been going on in Fallbrook for decades, um, where they cleared some more oak trees and planted some orange trees, essentially as landscaping. You all can see that that's not going to be looking like that for very long. It's an erosion problem, and it's probably already starting to erode. Those orange trees are going to require a huge amount of water, which now is very expensive down there, and so they will inevitably stop watering them. It doesn't matter because there's multiple overlapping quarantines against insect pests and you basically can't take citrus out of Fallbrook due to biological invasions. And this, you know, this is a this is a current photo, but it's a photo of my childhood. And I learned very at a young age that um, that you know things can change very fast. That in the time that it takes for you to finish high school, you can lose significant chunks of the landscape in which you grew up and the oak trees that sustained humans for generations. And that really we're all part of something that's happening very fast. And we all have a big role to play in making sure that it, you know, the change happens in a direction that, that makes sense to us all and that is healthy. So. And so tonight I'm gonna to talk about biological diversity and I wanna be very clear what I'm talking about. You know, we often talk, times talk about biodiversity as all kinds of things. It gets conflated with all kinds of stuff, ecosystem services, managing invasives, everything is biodiversity. And that's because everything is biodiversity. This is a living planet and everything that matters to us is, is either biodiversity or is an emergent property of biodiversity, nitrogen cycling, carbon storage. It's all connected to biodiversity. But biological diversity does have a fairly specific definition. And I like the definition. And, and when I talk about it, this is what I mean. I'm using the definition that, you know, it's an old definition put forth by scientists and adopted by the United, United Nations in their Convention on Biological Diversity. And biodiversity is the variability among living organisms from all sources at all levels. It includes diversity within species, between species and of ecosystems. So biodiversity doesn't mean the same thing as saving open space. It doesn't mean the same thing as sustainable agriculture. Those are important and they're related to biodiversity and they affect biodiversity and biodiversity affects them. But biodiversity is actually just, you know, the atomic level elements of life on earth. It's not just variability in what species are at a site, but variation in the codes variation in the DNA and, and the other information, the lineages that have evolved at a specific place, interspecies, intraspecies variation, the, the, the uniqueness of organisms at a place, the, the terminal lineages, and by terminal lineage, I mean, you know, individuals that are distinct from their brothers and sisters. That is biodiversity, the very granular level. Um, the stuff that's easier for us to grasp is critters, things, living things, specimens. So obviously it goes up to ecosystems and that's an important part, but too often we forget or we, or we, um, or we, we, we willfully neglect those things that are really the fundamental units of biological diversity, individuals, species, variation among within and among populations, things that are really hard to do that are, that require great expertise to be able to see and, and a lot more to understand and really complicate things. And therefore, you know, quite often we kind of move past them onto other things like, um, you know, ecosystem function or something. So that's biodiversity. And obviously it ranges from variation within populations. And um, I'm sorry, this is a bit of a fuzzy photo, but I took this, um, I took this photo at Bouvery Preserve in Sonoma Valley back when I got to work there with Sherry Adams. And, um, and this was, I thought it was a population of baby blue eyes um, at variety atomaria, the white baby blue eyes. And, and in this population, you would find strange little flowers that had, you know, it's a population of plants that, um, of a species that typically is blue, baby blue eyes, and a, and a variety that is white. Um, and in these populations, you would find flowers that had some of the blue. And, and you can see kind of this effervescence of radiation. Um, and I thought that this photo was an example of uh, variability within populations, just variability among individuals within you know, a patch. More recently, folks have actually described this and it's actually a separate variety, Nepensis, uh, which, which um, hasn't yet been collected from Boobery Preserve. So if anyone wants to get there and get a specimen, you're gonna get a new occurrence for Sonoma County. Um, it's a, thus far, it's known only as a Mendocino endemic. 
But this is the very fine scale variability. This is genetic variation among individuals within a population. And then obviously it goes up to variability, the biodiversity, the diversity of species at a site. And that's what we all kind of most are most comfortable with when we talk about biodiversity. That's kind of what we think about. This is the Audubon Canyon Ranch's uh, uh, Martin Griffin Preserve on uh, Bolinas Lagoon. And you can see variability, you know, new lineages, ancient lineages all mixed up. And then of course it, it, in, it involves variability, um, you know, the, the variation in ecosystems at a site, uh, such as this preserved land at San Quentin in, in Baja California. And so when we talk about biodiversity, a lot of the time we talk about biodiversity hotspots um, that Norm Myers came up with, and, we, and we've, all, we've all used the concept. And, uh, and these are parts on planet Earth where there is an especially high species richness and very high levels of endemism. That means that the species are only found there and nowhere else. And, and he identified, I believe, 35 of them. Um, and I think there's been another one or two added. Every time someone writes about it, they say, you know, 36 or 37. Um, and so it's in flux um, as we are still discovering the planet and figuring out how to delineate things. But as you can see here, California is hotspot number eight. We're a very special place on the planet Earth. We have, we are one of those places that has more biodiversity, that has an inordinate share of the Earth's life. Um, and as you can see, we're up there with the Western Ghats or Micronesia um, or Southern Australia or Western Australia, important places. So California, it's my home and I love it very much. And, and, and I think we have a good chance of saving a chunk of it if we hustle. And California has exceptionally high biodiversity for a number of reasons. Um, we are on the edge of a continent and as tectonic plates grind against each other, they have lifted up um, topography and they've exposed minerals that have created different variability in soils. Um, and that's all given kind of, you know, special places for things to, to for, ver for different organisms and very variability to, um, to thrive and, and reduced extinction rates and all of that kind of stuff. Another, another important element um, in kind of pumping the biodiversity of California, of course, is climate change. And during the, you know, during the, the last 11 million years, we've seen significant climate change and we've seen kind of pumping of, of, of biodiversity as, as climate warms and taxa move north from the south. And then as climate cools and taxa move south from the north, this, each time that these waves have passed back and forth, they've left some of themselves behind and, um, and, and kind of enriched the, the flora and the fauna of California. And so we all know, you know, here at the Native Plant Society, everyone's aware that California is a, a, a biodiversity hotspot for plants, that we, have, that we have more plants than any other state in the union, that we've got more rare plants than most states have plants. That California has 25% of the plant taxa that occur in North of Mexico. We're, we're comfortable with that for plants, but I don't know that all of us are necessarily aware of, of how, how broad our biodiversity is. It's across all taxa. Um, we, you know, for example, we have incredible insect diversity. We don't know whether thus far we have something like 10,000 taxa of insects that have been described, which is a lot, but we know that there's a lot more. And the best entomologists can only ballpark it. They don't know if it's 30,000 or 150,000. Um, we're going to find out, uh, but at this point we don't know. Um, for bees, California is comparable to the Amazon. We're, we're a hotspot of bee diversity. Of North America's 4,000 bee taxa, we've got something like 1,600. There's significantly more. And I, and I, I think Leslie on this uh, may be able to tell us some, some, some more on that, hopefully at the end of this, at the end of my spiel. Um, and then of course, um, you know, we've got significant threats to California's biodiversity. And this is, this is Mount Tam. It's a painting that I picked up at a junk shop in San Francisco in, you know, 2003 or something like that. And on the back of it, it says poppies on Mount Tam, uh, 1934. Um, and this is what the same site looks like in 2005, not quite today. You know, maybe they've closed the gate on that, cleaned up some piles or something. But this is habitat loss due to um, development. And obviously when we, when we develop sites, we, we take away someone's homes. Um, and, and so this is a big driver of loss of biodiversity in California. Um, this is the other side of Mount Tam, looking up from Stinson. And as you know, many of you know, that's, that's Helichrysum pidulari spreading across the mountain. Um, and so this is by way of showing that 
you know, not just development is harming biodiversity, but but um, biodiversity is harmed by biological invasions, be it invasive plants and weeds or pests um, or pathogens like oak death and Phytophthora. So we've got a number of threats. And so the result of that, and then, you know, another major threat, of course, is pollution, which also has very significant impacts uh, to human communities, and especially those those less privileged and, and you know suffering from a history of racism and are dumping our pollution in their neighborhoods. And so pollution ties into this particular slide, which is just, you know, you're not going to be able to read all this, and that's good because you'd probably take to drinking early if you did. Uh, but this is a list of insect declines um, that I pulled together that are kind of in the introduction of a paper by Matt Forrester et al. Uh, the title of the paper is something like Insect Declines We Know Enough to Act, which is a good title and, um, and a good paper. And, and these are some declines that they mentioned by way of you know, stating that there's an insect apocalypse going on. Um, and so just to drill down on this one aspect of global biodiversity and biodiversity in California, insect apocalypse is unfortunately a technical term at this point. We're losing insects across the board massively. Uh, the distributions are shrinking, populations are disappearing, biomass is plummeting, um, hillsides are going quiet, and plants are going unpollinated. And it's happening very rapidly without us really tracking it because insects are very hard to, to monitor, very hard to identify, very hard to know what's going on. And so really kind of, you know, our ability to detect change on insects um, depends on kind of very large pixel size, very, very obvious organisms like monarch butterflies that are widespread and easily identified. And even then we only detect declines when they're, you know, on the order of 99% per decade or something. Um, and so insects are kind of a good poster child for the loss of biodiversity that we're suffering right now. We're in a mass extinction event. We're in, you know, perhaps the sixth, sixth mass extinction event, um, and it's accelerating. So, so this is important. So I want to talk for the rest of this about what I think we all should be doing to try and fix things. What we, what we all have a responsibility to do to try and save biodiversity in California, and, and in that way, um, not only save a big chunk of Earth's biodiversity, you know, because California is very important, but also show that it can be done um, in a way that actually increases our prosperity, secures the foundations of our future, and, and you know, as California has done before, um, sets an example for the world, uh, or at least for the Biden administration. Um, and so the first thing that I think we need to do is admit that that we've that we've lost a fair bit, that we're going to lose more, and that we're not in we're not in we do not have the luxury of um, of preventing stuff from happening. That the things are going to happen. That we should have acted sooner and 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 at a larger scale. And um, and at this point, in addition to stopping the accelerating harm, we need to we need to save things. We need to collect specimens. We need to save in organisms that quite frankly will not be there in 50 years, no matter what we do. No matter what we do at this point, we're going to lose a lot. And so I think that it's very important for us to roll back kind of the usual priorities. Um, saving land is absolutely of paramount importance, but it's big and it's expensive and it's hard. We have to do it, but we also have to save organisms, which is small and cheap and easy and it gives us a gives us a safety net and it gives us a backup in case things get really bad we will still have those organisms um, and and for those that are going to be lost no matter how good we manage to make things um, we will we will have them and and there's an there's a good paper by peter raven and, and scott scott uh, miller uh, the chief scientist at smithsonian on this in in a recent uh, issue of science where they make the case that you know, in our collections today, there are many, many species which do not exist in the wild anymore, especially in the tropics, but also in, in temperate areas. And so I think we all need to, um, we need to save species. And so by way of giving an example of that, um, of how collections have, have, you know, saved something of the past, um, I want to talk a little bit about this Franciscan manzanita here. Um, this is Lester Roundtree. Uh, standing on a hill on, on Lone Mountain in San Francisco with one of the last surviving individuals of the Franciscan Manzanita that was discovered by, by Alice Eastwood, a fantastic botanist. And, um, and this, is, this is that site, you know, before 
they put in the, the tennis courts that you can see in the center left there. You can see that greenery. That's the same bluff that's looking down. And so that manzanita uh, was collected by Alice Eastwood and preserved as specimens in the California Academy of Sciences and collected by Lester Roundtree and, 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 um, and, and, and saved as a living individual. And so we still have that plant. Here I have a, a photo of Governor Jerry Brown and, and the new Western curator of uh, botany at the Calicat, uh, Sarah, Sarah Jacobs there, looking at Alice Eastwood's type specimen of the Franciscan Manzanita. And so these are examples of, uh, you know, I'm just damn glad that someone saved that. I'm so glad that, that she took the time to collect the specimens and, and that, that Lester Roundtree collected the individuals. And there are many, many organisms that, that only exist in our, in our collections um, and there's going to be a lot more in the future. Um, so by way of what we can do on this, as I said, it's very easy. And that doesn't mean it's, it's easy, it's, it's relatively easy. Um, it's pretty much the easiest thing that we can do uh, for conservation. Uh, we've been you know, saving living organisms. We've been collecting organisms since long before we were humans. It's baked into us, it's, it's fun, it's attractive, it's uh, paleolithic technology. And so this is, you know, this is uh, my wife and daughter holding a bunch of seeds that they collected from our front yard uh, so that I could have a slide to show you uh, an example of seed collection. And so seed collection is an easy way to save organisms. Um, uh, it, it takes work. The people doing it are dedicated and they get tired at the end of the day and, and you have to fundraise to, to pay for it. it. It doesn't necessarily happen automatically. It takes a lot of coordination, but it's, but it's infinitely easier and faster uh, than saving places. And so it's an important addition to our usual portfolio of conservation. And, and by way of example, um, in, um, uh, in California, we have the California Plant Rescue, which was started you know, on the, with Peter Raven urging us to collect seeds of all of California's rare plants. Um, and, and, and catalyzing formation of a group that included institutions, museums, botanic gardens, uh, universities from all over California, maybe a couple dozen entities uh, that spent a few years collecting seeds. And, and around the time that we had got into about 50% of California's rare plants backed up in cold storage, um, we had an opportunity to seek funding from the legislature to do the other 50%. And, um, and so I, I, I brought this proposal to uh, uh, Assembly Member Ash Kalra, uh, who took it forward as a member request and the legislature approved $3.6 million to see bank all of California's rare plants. And the governor signed it into law. And then for the last three years, as a consequence for the last three years, that money has been distributed among the couple dozen entities that are you know, probably right now someone in, in that consortium is driving home from a site where they just collected seeds. They're out there cranking through the flora, backing it up. It's not the same as saving the places. It's not the same as saving the populations in the wild. It's nowhere close. It's more analogous to backing up your computer. When your computer gets totally fried and destroyed, um, it, it's a bummer, but you're glad you backed it up. And so saving organisms is, is like that. It also has other immediate value. It, um, it gives us important data that we need to save places. It tells us what's out there and where it occurs, what is most rare and close to the edge of extinction, where are the biodiversity hotspots and the special places that we really need to fight to save, um, uh, uh, where are the peripheral populations that are gonna be resilient against climate change, all that kind of stuff. So the data that we get in the process of saving organisms is incredibly valuable. Uh, for a lot of people, that's the main reason to go out and do this. Uh, but for me, I really like the idea of having these organisms preserved in collections and available to you know, our descendants uh, who, will, who will value this stuff as the most, most valuable material on earth. So we need to do it not just for plant seeds, we need to do it for fungi, uh, which obviously are much more diverse than, than plants um, by I think like two orders of magnitude, something like that. Um, and we need to, to do it for insects because as you, you know, as I mentioned, we're, we're in the midst of an insect apocalypse uh, that we, we're not even really sure what's going on. Um, we know enough to act. We don't necessarily have the science pinned down well. I, I definitely recommend that paper. I can put it in the chat later on. Uh, but they have a metaphor that's very useful um, where they talk about insects facing a firing squad. And when we, when we try and identify which entity in the firing squad, so the firing squad is comprised of the usual suspects, uh, climate change, fire, habitat loss, pesticides, disease, 
all of those things are in the firing squad. And when you look at any insect and its declines and you really try and identify exactly exactly which driver is causing it to, to diminish, um, it can be really hard to figure out which rifle fired the bullet. But we know that they're facing a firing squad and regardless of which, which rifle fired that bullet that actually drove the thing to the edge, um, uh, they're, you know, they're all hitting it. So we need to save insects while we still can, even as we, I, as, even as we ameliorate the causes and, and halt the, uh, the you know, looming um, uh, insect apocalypse. And on this, um, I see Mia Monroe's on the, on the call, so that's great. Hopefully at the end of this, we can have a discussion about, about a somewhat controversial idea of, of actually doing a condor rescue for, for monarch butterflies. Where you know the gist there is that um, monarch, the migratory western migratory monarch is essentially extinct. Its population has dropped below the level at which they will be able to find mates. Um, alley effects and other factors um, have doomed it to extinction. But there are still a few individuals out there, and so um, just as we did with the condor, when it was below a level that was sustainable, we went out and we captured some condors and we saved them. And thus, we still have condors. And, uh, and we're working with a group that believes that, unfortunately, um, we've reached the point where we need to do, um, we need to do an, an urgent intervention like that in order to, to save some of the migratory monarchs um, beyond this winter, really, if there are any left this winter. So we need to save things, number one. Number two is we need to save places. And, and obviously, this is the actual number one. If we save all the places, then we're pretty good. Uh, but as I mentioned, saving places is a heavy lift. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of money. Um, but it's incredibly important. And so by way of talking about saving places, I wanted to show this slide. Um, I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it through the little Zoom windows. So I'll just talk you through it. It's a diagram of the proposed freeway system that was going to hump over the mountains from Highway 101 um, and make West Marin fully accessible. And it was designed... Um, you know, by the same types of folks who had just done the same thing to Orange County and put freeway systems over to Huntington Beach and Laguna and, um, and made that coast accessible. And they had a plan to do to Bolinas Lagoon what they did to Huntington Beach, dredge it all out, put in homes, boat ramps, you know, hotels, make it productive. Um, and so this was a fate, this was, you know, this was the plan for Marin. I think probably most of you know, you know, the story of how, how we saved Marin. Um, and by we, I mean you. Um, I was, you know, I was in Fallbrook looking at acorns at that point. But um, this is the power of saving places. This is a this is a map showing here at the very top. That topmost sign says Mill Valley over the hill, and at the very bottom you've got Muir Beach. And all of that was supposed to be developed, as was Bodega, as was you know everything up to Bodega with its nuclear reactor um, and Point Reyes Peninsula. Um, it was all going to be, you know, coastal Southern California, um, and and we stopped it. It was stopped, and as a result, we've saved inordinate amounts of biodiversity. So saving places, definitely the way to go. And so here's a nice picture of uh, Bolinas Lagoon, uh, just to make us all happy. And we've also seen what happens when you fail to act, when you fail to save places. And so this is this is a you know. A nice contrast, um, maybe an informative contrast is a better way of talking about it. This is the northern end of Carrizo Plain. Um, so this, in this photo, we are looking east at the Temblors, which are protected, more or less. They're, I believe, they're federal land. I believe that's BLM land. Um, and so, as a result, you can see fantastic wildflower displays up there. In the foreground, it's unprotected land. It's land that we thought would never be developed. Too alkaline to grow anything, too hot for anyone to live, especially with no water at all. Um, one of those places that is safe, where the biodiversity will thrive and we don't even need to acquire the land and protect it. Uh, but we were wrong. Um, humans are clever monkeys. And if you got, you know, if you got something cheap, uh, they'll figure out how to make some money off it. And in this case, uh, you know, the how to do that was for, um, you know, Berkshire Hathaway Solar to put in solar farms and, and others to develop solar farms there. And so this is a, this contrast shows, um, you know, what happens when we fail to save land. And this shows where we're going. This is um, actually a technical blueprint for uh, the United States 2050. Haha, <laughs> just kidding. Um, but in truth, um, you know, but only just kidding. Um, 
at this point, we've got a commitment to go, I believe, 45% uh, electric. I, I believe Biden has made a commitment to be 45% um, renewable energy by 2050 in, in less than 30 years, which is incredible. At this point, we're, I believe, 4%, 3 or 4% uh, renewable nationwide. And so it's an incredible scale up. I heard on a call, um, and Mike Painter was on that call too last week, um, that they're putting a transmission corridor from uh, Las Vegas uh, to Reno, and and as you know, and as part of that, planning to put uh, just to pave the desert um, end to end uh, with solar panels from Beatty to Amargosa, up against the edge of Death Valley National Monument. For now, you know, until presumably we can fast track put in the panels on the monument. So this is where we stand. This is this is why saving places um, is especially urgent right now. Um, because we only have a short window. In the next, you know, in the next 30 years, all of the places will be spoken for. They will be used to generate renewable energy. They will be used to sequester carbon. They'll be used for transit and housing. They'll be used for farms. They'll be used for biodiversity conservation. We're going to deliberately make these decisions over, over the, the years, well, really the months and years to come. And, and we biodiversity lovers need to be in the mix on that generating information, the data that we need. As we go out and collect things, we, we generate data that will tell us which places we have to save. And we also have to be there advocating to actually save them. And at the end, I wanna talk about some state initiatives that we have going on now uh, that give us some great opportunities for that. And then the third thing that we have to do is people. We gotta, we gotta grow our community. We gotta increase opportunity, equity, access, we need help and we need to change the way that we do conservation. Um, and, and, and first I wanna thank, you know, this is kind of a, a rogues gallery of super savers. Um, on, on the right, you've got a column of folks who've saved land, who saved ecosystem types. Carol with them up there, I blame her for saving vernal pools. When I was a grad student, we all knew that they were all, we were just gonna lose them. And, you know, the, the habitat type was probably gonna be basically gone. And, and she refused to accept that and saved, you know, a significant chunk of California's vernal pools. She wasn't the only one, uh, but she, her picture's up there. Um, Graham Chisholm has spent his career saving lands. Um, obviously Phyllis Faber uh, gets, all, gets a lot of credit. And then on the left, we've got folks who are um, super collectors of plants, folks who've collected 50,000 specimens, 150,000 specimens in herbaria um, from all, over, all across California and Baja California, Mexico. And you can recognize some faces. I'm not going to go through it all. But people are what get this stuff done. Um, it's, it's critically important. And they all did this as individuals. They didn't, you know, form committees to do it and then take a few decades and then get approval and, you know, all that kind of stuff. They're just obsessed with collecting. They're just obsessed with getting out there and saving things. Um, which is, I believe, kind of at the at the root level of our code, that humans are driven to go out and pick up things, pick up seeds, pick up cones, pick up mushrooms. Um, and, and it's not so much a matter of training as a matter of permission to turn that into, to give those people the ability to not just pick it up, but preserve it in durable collections in perpetuity. Um, obviously, People are critical for saving land. And this is how we did it. We, you know, the Royal, we, we all of us did it back in 1965 um, or maybe 67, something like that. Um, these are the kinds of, you know, at that point, it was very clear that we, we were making choices about what we wanted Marin, in this case, to look like. And we are making those choices today. And I think we sometimes lose track of that. We, we think there's a story and we're watching the story or that it's, that it's you know, too big and someone else is making the choice. But at this point, we're making the choices and, and, and this is you know, a chance to plug, um, you know, make your choice go. Hopefully everyone here has filled out your ballots and sent them in and made a choice there, uh, which, is, which is important to conservation of biodiversity in, in, right now. Um, and so this was the decision. So that initial diagram that I showed you of the proposed highway and freeway network uh, connecting West Marin to the world um, was ended by this kind of stuff where people actually you know, took advertisements out in the sun um, at election time and convinced their neighbors and their friends to, to get out and vote and to vote the right way. And we all need to be doing more of that. 
people on this call need to be running for office. We need people, you know, this is a case of an Audubon Canyon rancher running for office and they did it for MMWD and they got a majority on MMWD and put a moratorium on new water hookups. By electing our people to office, we got the change that we needed and we saved lands and we saved biodiversity. And then oh, I thought I had another slide in there. Um, and, and, um, and at this point, I'll just do this. And at this point, you know, we have a real special opportunity for, for the people part of this equation. Um, what I've talked about here, you know, you'll see that, you know, this was the old conservation where you had to be born in the right neighborhood and go to the right school and either earn your PhD or become a doctor so that you had the disposable income and the means to be able to run for office and advocate and that kind of stuff. It's a very narrow path that excluded most Californians. And we've and we've and we're rebuilding that path. At this point in time, as you all know, there's an inclusion revolution going on, and we no longer accept that. And we're all much more aware of the history of racism that has that has hampered the conservation movement as it's hampered everything else in America. And we're increasingly committed to 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 changing that. And so, people is the biggest opportunity, and and um, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit more in a couple of slides. And then just by wrapping up, um, I wanted to, um, you know, just do talk briefly about reasons for optimism and, and kind of how we're going to do this stuff. Um, I do believe that it's not too late. There are some tax, uh, there are many populations that we, that we are going to lose, some tax that we are going to lose, um, no matter how good our conservation game is going forward, um, things are going to change. We're gonna have fire, we're gonna have drought, we're gonna have sea level rise, we're gonna lose things. We're gonna to have to make development decisions, even if we're incredibly enlightened, there will still be tough compromises and we will lose stuff. Um, but we don't have to lose too much. We still have tremendous, you know, California is still mostly wild. We've got 50% of our land is protected. Doesn't mean it's conserved for biodiversity, but it does mean that it's public land and protected from immediate, you know, mollification. Um, and, and we've got a lot of other resources. So I, I feel like we have a lot of reason for hope. Um, and, and actually, you know, when I took that photo, that was, you know, that was ranch land, unprotected land owned by folks who, who like the flowers on it in Bear Valley. Um, that's, that's a, you know, a rare Bear Valley photo with only one wildflower in it. Um, uh, but since I took that photo about five years ago, those owners, uh, gave a chunk of their land and, and, and sold part of it for as a conservation easement uh, to have it permanently protected. And so this is, this is what we do. So, you know, how we do this, and again, I wanna say that, you know, we have a lot of, we have, a, we, we have opportunity, but, you know, just like this recall election, um, it really depends on turnout and action. And, and so the opportunity that we have is that, for one thing, we understand all of this much better. We know what's at stake. We have maps of our biodiversity. We're benefiting from generations of folks who've done hard work, you know, stumbling around in the darkness to try and figure out what we have, to try and figure out what kind of laws we need to protect things, to try and figure out systems for defending those laws, um, to try and figure out how to organize and team up on stuff. All of that, you know, that took a lot of work and that, and, and that is a gift to current generations uh, that we that gives us more power than we've ever had. We've also got incredible technology here on this. You know, this just shows a couple couple fun technologies for revolutionizing uh, how we can how we can map, monitor, and um, and understand insects. You know, on the and and it, and it goes for anything else. On the left is kind of stylized um, protocols for DNA barcoding. Um, really incredible 21st century technology that makes it possible to monitor insects at a site, uh, characterize the insect fauna at a site um, for, you know, dozens of dollars instead of thousands of dollars and dozens of years. Um, and then on the right hand side is just some fun stuff from another paper of folks looking at um, computer vision, uh, machine learning um, to identify insects. Um, uh, from traps um, and samples where you, you know, basically you can have a jar with 50,000 insects in it, plug it into the machine and it starts, you can see that jar in the upper right. Um, let me be the, the sample jar, but a jar just like that, um, full of 
impossible to identify bugs. And the machine just kind of sucks them through one at a time, um, takes a million photos from every possible angle, compares them against, um, uh, and, the, and then the machine uses photos taken from museum specimens and others, um, and applies um, machine learning uh, to, to tell you what's in your jar. Um, and again, this is you know incredibly cheap compared to what it takes to train a PhD, to train you know a few dozen PhD entomologists in all the different families that are in that jar. We've got incredible technology. That includes incredible GIS systems, it includes drones, it includes all kinds of cool stuff. So we've got we've got the tech, we've got the tools that we need. We've got the conceptual tools, and we've got the technological tools. And, and that also includes um, things that we don't normally think of as conservation tools, um, like apps and, and basically systems for social organization um, that allow someone to um, organize a bio blitz for pollinators in Marin um, and get a few hundred Marin CNPSers going out with your, your phones and collecting really important data. Um, those are tools that we didn't have 20 years ago that allow us to do incredible, incredible things at scale and speed and precision that, we, that no one has ever had before. So we've got the tools um, and we've also got political opportunity. And the political opportunity comes from you know, growing public awareness where individuals are increasingly concerned about the extinction crisis and about the danger of losing the things that we love. You know, we're worried about destabilized biospheres, but I think fundamentally most of us are just worried about losing, losing critters um, that we may not ever see, that we don't know how to identify, uh, but we feel diminished uh, when we hear that some one of them went extinct. And that is driving, you know, that is those that public perception is being heard by our legislators um, and 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 they're acting. And so here I want to, and so there's th there's three initiatives uh, that are especially important right now in California and tremendous opportunities for all of us to get involved. The first, of course, is the California Biodiversity Initiative, which we started in 2018. And then in September of 2019, um, uh, Governor Brown released the charter that we wrote um, for uh, uh, securing the future of California's biodiversity and issued a, a roadmap, as you can see here, that we drafted with kind of a 30,000 foot overview of some ideas for how to save it and issued a couple executive orders and proclamations naming California Biodiversity Day. Uh, that was last the 7th um, and, um, and, and directing all state agencies to make conservation of biodiversity a priority and for them all to coordinate on that under the leadership of the Natural Resources Agency and the Department of Agriculture. So that's that's an that's a one very important initiative um, that is continuing to grow. Um, uh, the gubernatorial change when Newsom came in um, um, was a bit of a was a, um, a, a moment of pause um, while we waited for the new administration to get up to speed and 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 watched to see um, the degree to which they would take this new initiative and run with it. And they have they completely run with it. Um, and then obviously the pandemic has caused us to slow down on a bit. Another big initiative that you've probably heard of is 30 by 30. Um, the, you know, part of a global movement to conserve 30% of planet earth by the year 2030. And this comes from, this comes from um, basic island biogeography. E.O. Wilson, Wilson and MacArthur came up with some basic math to describe the rate at which you lose species as you shrink habitat. And, and years later, E.O. Wilson, Started doing calculations to try and to try and calculate how much of Earth's habitats we need to save to preserve our biodiversity. And he set just kind of arbitrarily, you know, the goal of saving 80% of Earth's biodiversity. And when he did the math, that came up to, you know, we would need to save half of Earth, the half Earth project. And since then he's been he's been advocating for that. And I think it's really resonated. 30 by 30 is the first big step on that. We want to save half Earth, 50% of Earth's lands and waters by 2050. To do that, we need to save 30% by 2030, and then add an, an additional 20% to the portfolio. And that 30%, and so that's a global, you know, it's a global movement that was picked up by the Newsom administration and, and made the law of the land in an executive order in October of last year. And, and under that, Newsom has mandated that California, in order to save our biodiversity and to reduce climate risk, California will save, conserve, 
30% of our lands and coastal waters by the year 2030. And agencies are required to put together a, a, a plan that includes pathways to 30 by 30, and they have to deliver that by February. So right now, um, you know, our colleagues are in Sacramento working very hard to develop that plan. They've done stakeholder meetings. Many of you have been on those calls. Right now, we're figuring out what that means. They're literally figuring out what the definition of conserved is, and then we'll be figuring out how we're going to go about conserving it. Biodiversity needs to be front and center on that. So I would ask you all to stay involved in this, of course. And as you do, uh, make it clear that 30 by 30 is about biodiversity. It comes from biodiversity calculations. The intent is to save biodiversity. And thus, the frameworks that we apply must be biodiversity focused. We want to not just save 30% of California's real estate, where you can go buy some cheap land in the desert and you're done, but we need to actually do careful calculations so that we know that the lands that we are acquiring and protecting are actually part of a conservation portfolio designed to secure the biodiversity that we've got. And then the third big initiative, as I mentioned, um, and I don't know if it's a, it's, it's across all of state government, but it's an, it's an opportunity and an inclusion um, initiative uh, where we're, 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 we're remaking everything that we do in California to be more reflective of, of who's in California. Um, and as you know, thus far, most Californians have been excluded from all of this stuff, as, as they've been excluded from everything except for living next to an excise plant. And, and, um, and this is a tremendous opportunity to do it right. The first few, you know, the first many decades of land conservation in California were designed, um, were, you know, we, we, we designed those portfolios based on a very narrow set of perspectives and a small community weighed in. And those investments went to benefit those people in their neighborhoods and it left out much of California. And the opportunity now, the need, is to do the rest of California as well, to make sure that there's land secured in proximity to populations that, that can't drive to West Marin or can't drive to Yosemite, um, where there are parks in people's neighborhoods and where we're securing biodiversity locally for all Californians. And then on the flip side, make sure that all Californians have, not only do they have a chance to be the decision-making process, but they have a chance to get in the work. A, and that doesn't mean just dragging rakes around forests and, and pulling weeds, but it means, um, it means um, access to education opportunities that allow them to become county planners um, that, and, and, um, and fellowships and stipends and living wages so that folks actually, so that folks in Fresno and folks in Shafter are actually involved in the planning decisions for acquiring and protecting land in Shafter. And so this is a huge opportunity for California and reason for hope. Um, you know, part of the reason that our, and to be clear, I, having worked in the legislature a lot in the last few years, I'm, 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 I think we've got a really good team there. We have folks like um, Luz Rivas, who's the chair of natural, Assembly and Natural Resources. Uh, Luz Rivas uh, grew up in Pacoima um, in a family where there were no scientists, there were no doctors, they didn't know any scientists or doctors. Um, uh, that wasn't part of their reality. Somehow Luz got into math and somehow she wound up going to MIT and, and, got, her, and got her degree in math at MIT. And then, and then wound up teaching, you know, teaching girls who looked like her, who had no role models. Um, she wound up being a role model for them, teaching them math, trying to change the world. Um, and eventually realized that she couldn't do, she couldn't do that one, one girl at a time. And so formed a nonprofit. Uh, to teach STEM skills and provide provide you know an, an example uh, to more kids, and ultimately realized that to really make a difference, she had to get into the legislature, and so she did. And uh, now, um, and now she's chair of natural resources in her district. Twenty four percent of the kids are homeless. They live in cars. They go to school hungry, and then they go home to the car. So she's chair of natural resources bringing a completely different perspective to it than you would have seen 20 years ago. A perspective that understands that, that exposure to extreme heat in those communities is an environmental hazard that can be ameliorated by, by biodiverse planting of trees in those neighborhoods. Um, and, and as a result, um, in this budget season, and she's just, she's just one of many examples, you know, Christina Garcia has a very similar story, actually. Um, and basically the pantheon of leaders in the assembly in the state and the Senate right now um, are, 
are we, I, we could not think of better folks to be doing this. And as a result, when we got record budget surplus this year, thanks to California's progressive tax system, we got an insanely large revenue surplus, um, uh, something like an additional $80 billion. And so we scrapped plans to do an environmental bond and then instead just rolled in that general funding to do multiple bonds, putting $12 million, $12 billion into homelessness, $8 billion into housing. We're putting $4.6 billion into water and drought. We're putting $3.6 billion into climate resilience. And that includes you know, all the stuff that we would think of, kind of includes everything except for land acquisition to be, to be frank, but, but hopefully, we, the, you know, the, the projections show that next year and the next year will likely have comparable surpluses, you know, unless, unless the bottom drops out of the bucket. And so we're agitating so that in year two and year three, money goes to land acquisition informed by the understandings and the realizations and the frameworks that we benefit from today. And there's a slide. Maybe that was what I should have shown while I was babbling about stuff. Um, I guess since it's got a rainbow, then it, then it, then it means that, you know, I think we've, we've got big reasons for hope. Um, we don't have time to waste. We've, frankly, we've, you know, we've done, I guess an optim, a, a positive way of looking at it is that we've run a series of pilot experiments. We've tinkered, we've poked around. I've planted plants in my garden and I've watched, and I've watched tons of insects come to my front yard. We've saved places, we've gone to public hearings, we've collected some seeds, we've done all kinds of things. We've done lots of little projects that have really shown us what we can do. But we no longer have time for small things. We no longer have time for, for, you know, for pulling weeds that don't need to be pulled. We need to pull weeds only at sites where those weeds are threatening the persistence of an organism in the coming years, in the near coming years. We need to focus on the really big things uh, that really make a difference. We need to be focusing on the big ideas and being ambitious about it and, and moving forward aggressively. Um, if we do that, we'll be able to save all of this and we'll be in a much better place. We'll be in a world where we've got biodiversity in our neighborhoods and in our cities, and we don't have to worry about cooking the planet to death and, and, you know, and all of the wonderful things. We are on the cusp of being able to do that. We have the opportunity, we have the technology, we've got the money right now against all odds. I just hope that we have the will. And that means, well, it means a lot of stuff. Maybe we can talk about it in the, in the, in the, in the Q and A. So we can also talk about if you wanna fire off an email and let me know what you think or send me ideas or whatever. Um, this is my, my address and I, I welcome hearing from you. All right, thanks. Dan, thanks so much for that call to action. Uh, we have some uh, questions in the chat. Uh, I'd like to go through them first. Um, when Larry Bathgate asked, when was that solar farm put in on Carrizo Plain? Um, I'm not sure uh, when it was put in. And, um, you know, my post COVID memory is really not what it used to be. Um, that photo was taken in. 2016, um, I believe the farms were put in kind of over, you know, the decade previous. Um, they're still going in fast, fast and furious. Um, yeah. Uh, Denise Louie says, any ideas how to get landscapers to choose local native plants? Even though the San Francisco Board of Supervisors passed a biodiversity resolution, senior landscapers at DPW choose non-natives and non-local natives for open spaces even within feet of the city's designated significant natural resource area. Today, contractors sprayed a green carpet of quote native grass seeds on an open space on Mount Davidson at the end of, at the edge of Glen Canyon. So it comes back to, how do you get landscapers to choose local native plants? Yeah, well, that's a really good question. Um, and I, I think, uh, you know, that's a good question for, um, fortunately we've got folks at CNPS working on that. Uh, Becky, uh, sorry, sorry, I'm, I'm being, I'm being a little, sorry. Denise, I, that's a really good question. I'm happy to talk about you with you anytime. Um, and, and, and there's a lot of solutions, I think, to, to moving that forward. It's not easy, but we can do it. However, I don't think we're ready for it. When I was at CNPS, one of my greatest fears was that 
um, that we were fighting the last battle or whatever, fighting the last war, um, that, that we had succeeded too much in convincing people to plant native plants and that we were going to see them plant huge numbers of things that, you know, scientists would not consider native plants. Things like, you know, for example, let me tell you what they did in Texas. Um, people love the Texas lupin, state flower, Texas blue bonnet. Um, and they were already spreading seeds of that thing around the state before Lady Bird Johnson made it the thing to do. And then her husband passed the National Scenic Highway and Recreation Act of 1965 or whatever. And as a result, they started pumping out tons of seeds of the Texas lupin. Um, and, and they continue to this day. Those seeds come from Nebraska, where they have huge farms, where they grow these seeds, bag them up millions of pounds, and they get spread around Texas. A recent paper, well, five years ago, uh, 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 showed that they've actually eliminated the Texas blue bonnet, uh, the state flower in doing that. They looked at older barium specimens um, and pulled material off of them and sequenced it and found that back in the day, there wasn't a, a Texas, it was actually a species complex. It wasn't one species, it was a very diverse complex of lupins. And as they, as they farmed them and put the seeds out there, they reduced the variability of that. And, they, and so when you go out and sample contemporary populations, it doesn't matter how far from a highway you go, you find the same thing. It's monomictic, there's one genotype, it's like astroturf. It's beautiful. It's a great thing. And I'm sure there's bees that like it. But we, but Texas lost a diverse species complex that they were trying to save by spreading those plants around. I fear that we will do the same thing. Um, I fear that we will convince people to plant native plants at scale and they'll go out to enthusiastically do what we convinced them to do and they won't have the material. Right now, you can't get the local seeds um, uh, or other plants. And so I think the number one thing that we need to do is actually kind of be thankful that it's not going at the pace uh, that we had previously wished and take this moment to build the systems of material supply and the rules um, so that we are actually, you know, so that as we scale up native plant planting for restoration, for gardening, for landscaping, um, we're planting the right stuff and we're not doing more harm than good. Uh, Becky Thorman asks, has anyone successfully germinated manzanita seeds resulting in seedlings? I have not found a reliable tutorial with proven results. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, they haven't for the Franciscan manzanita is my understanding, um, or for the Raven's manzanita. Those things, there's, you know, there's just um, not the, there's not the diversity. They, they need they need, and, and that's a, another case of where, you know, the, the hidden diversity in populations is incredibly important. We've saved individuals of those plants, but they can't make babies because they can't, they can't mate with themselves. Um, so, yeah. And uh, Paul De Silva says, Denise's question is a really important one. We hope to answer it with the Marin Biodiversity Corridor Community Initiative, MBCI. Uh, so that's a, a local response, which Paul is, uh, is coordinating. Laura Lovett says, it seems to me that we need actions that will solve multiple problems at once in order to get ahead of the decline. Other than buying or preserving land, what else will have a bigger or faster impact? Um, electing each other to uh, positions of authority. Yeah. Okay. Uh, not me, but um, but other people. Somebody's got to take the hit. Uh, we need more of our community in there. People who get it, and we've we've got we've got really good people who are super smart. You know, as I was talking about, you know, my adulation of various legislators. Um, I have a huge amount of respect for them. They're super smart, and when you talk to them, they get it, and they tend to do the right thing. But it's not the same thing as someone who you know comes in with this as their mission. Betsy Crawford is uh, commenting on the uh, difficulty of getting landscapers involved. She says, as a retired landscape designer, I can't begin to describe the ignorance about native plants of so many landscapers. Sadly, it's not in the interest of the landscaping and nursery industries to commit to natives. Uh, and Paul is saying, we need to help every person in California get better acquainted with our flora and fauna. And love all species. Uh, Leslie Saul uh, Gershon asks, suggestion for the next 30-30, 30, 30, 
stop the BLM licensing pristine desert, desert wildlands for solar farms. Well, that, that was the effort that uh, consumed CNPS in Southern California for so many years. Uh, yeah, yeah, and it, there's a lot of really good people working on it. Um, you know, Mike Painter is on this call and um, with, with um, Californians for Western Wilderness, and he's one of many others who are, you know, dedicated their lives to uh, saving our public lands. Um, increasingly, you know, as you all know, as we, as we do, as we deploy renewable energy at industrial scale, um, we're, there's going to be more push for, for, for that stuff. And so um, it's tough. The main thing that we need to do there is push for distributed solar. Well, the main thing that we need to do is resuscitate this crazy, crazy antiquated concept from like 1976 called conservation, um, conservation, energy conservation. And then, and then after that, we need to be uh, making sure that our generation is distributed, um, that we that we generate those electrons where we burn them. Great. Mia Monroe says, "Hope Dan will share his bold rescue and hope for monarchs." Uh, Thank you, Nia. Uh, well, I I I'd like to open it up. Uh, you can unmute yourself I, if you want to ask a question of Dan or make a comment. Uh, I would encourage you, since there are so many of you and I can't see you all, to use the reactions button, which if you're on a computer is at the bottom of your screen and there's a raise hand feature there. So uh, Laura, you're, you're the first. Why don't you go ahead? You can unmute yourself. Okay. Um, Dan, of the 3.6 billion that's going into climate resilience for the, from the current state budget, Mm -hmm. um, what specific things are going to help biodiversity? Yeah, um, th that stuff's all over the place. Um, there's, there's significant money for the Wildlife Conservation Board, but it's mostly not for biodiversity and actually also in the water section. Um, you know, as I mentioned, there's 3.7 for climate resilience, 4.6 for water, if I'm remembering correctly. And, um, and so Wildlife Conservation Board's getting a ton of money, some of which can go to acquisition, a lot of it can go to large scale restoration projects. Um, uh, there's state parks is getting a, tons of money for all kinds of stuff for, um, for managing their lands. Some a little bit for acquisition, uh, certainly a lot for, um, for developing parks in places like Bell Gardens, which have been just completely excluded from you know, those benefits. Um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big budget. There's about 1,200 pages and counting. Well, I guess we're done for now, but we went up doing like six budget bill juniors and 100 trailer bills. Um, so I can, I can send you, the, I, I can, you, y'all can go on uh, 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 dof.ca.gov, the Department of Finance has, you know, the e-budget up in there. Um, we will be hearing more about it. Uh, Friday was the last day of the session and they were working hot and heavy right up to that point. Uh, and now it's time for the legislators to start talking about what they've done. It's been really been kept secret. And, and you know, it, as, a, as a reference, you know, 4.6 billion, 3.7, what does that even mean? Um, last year's budget, I think was something like 150 billion and this year's budget, I think is like 260 billion. Um, those numbers are basically like, they're so much bigger than what they were in the past that they're basically like on top of zero. It's, it's huge money, a huge environmental bomb, the kind of thing that sustains our movement for a decade or for two decades might be 5 billion. And this year we're cranking out 4 billion here, 5 billion there, 6 billion there. Um, it's really spectacular. Much of this is on three year spending plans and so um, I think the biggest challenge is going to, again, is going to be people. Um, much of it is being designed to provide opportunity and just kind of, you know, make up for the mistakes of the past with regard to including everybody. But it's still going to be really hard. You know, for example, in fire, um, the governor got a lot of flack for not putting more money into fire for, you know, Cal Fire not spending all the money that they were given last year. But, you know, you just can't spend it. There's only so many chainsaws you can buy. There's only so many people who can wing a chainsaw. And so they, they put in 800 million for fire this time around. Um, yeah. And so the challenges are going to be in, in, in getting that money on the ground. 
that's going to be right. It, it, the challenge is in, direct, in directing it. So the question is, you know, how can we as ordinary citizens help to direct it? You know, where where it really will make a difference. So. Yeah, and believe me, I'm working on that, um, and I don't <laughs> good, have good. a good answer. Um, <laughs> And it, and you know, another interesting piece that you know you may not have heard about because no one knows that in Section 23 of the bill, you know, of SB 170, I think it was, they suspended CEQA for restoration projects. So if it's if it's for habitat, then go at it. Here's here's a few wheelbarrows of money, and you don't got to do CEQA. Uh, so for folks like us, for who you know, we feel like. CEQA can be good. Um, uh, it's a that's an added challenge to making sure that our voices are included and that our, our data and expertise help inform the projects. Um, so I guess I would just say, um, yeah, I don't know. Okay. I don't know that one. Yeah. Very, keep very, um, but but it, but again, um, but this is you know the projections are incredible. California has got a very progressive tax system. You've heard this. Um, and when insanely wealthy people make insane amounts of money in one year, they have to pay a little bit of tax on it. They don't feel it. It's not a lot of money by their standards, but by our standards, it's incredible. And so the projections are that, you know, because of you know, because of various stuff, they're gonna keep making a lot of money for the next couple of years. And we're gonna get to do this again, starting, you know, January 11th, they, the legislators come back. The, the, the governor puts his budget out uh, uh, or her budget, whoever it is, uh, January 10th. And so, um, you know, we just finished the session and now we're starting up again. And we will have a chance to to do a little bit better this time around, and maybe the time after. Again, unless you know the omega variant comes and knocks the bottom out of the bucket or something. Mm. Terry Thomas, you can unmute. Yeah. Hey Dan, hi um, Terry. You you made a statement that was curious to me because the way you made it, it was like you knew you had something in the back of your head, and it was we should stop pulling weeds that don't need to be pulled. And then you also in this kind of the same breath said, we need to focus on areas that are bigger and need to be saved. And I just wondered if you could go a step deeper into those statements and figure out what, what criteria do we use to not pull weeds and to focus on certain areas? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I've been out of restoration biz for a little while since I um, went to Cal Flora. And so maybe things have gotten a lot better. Um, but back when I was taking, when I was uh, doing directing habitat protection and restoration for Audubon Canyon ranches, 31 properties, um, I did a lot of weed whacking, a lot of weed pulling, and I had volunteer teams, which were super dedicated, super awesome people um, who would come out, you know, every Saturday or every second Tuesday or whatever it is, and 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 I needed to come up with projects for them, and it was a challenge to make sure that all of those projects were were really worthwhile. Um, and sometimes we would, um, uh, and I'm trying to not name names or anything, but there are projects where um, there are volunteer, for example, volunteer restoration programs where um, the land manager in charge of the site has to scramble to come up with something and winds up putting that team on carpet rolling ice plant some more you know, just kind of chipping away at a problem that is never going to get solved. And that actually can make it worse when you when you roll the ice plant, then you get, you know, rip gut brome and vulpia coming in, which is you can't get rid of that stuff. We in the weed world, we did a lot of that kind of stuff. I genuinely believe that much of the work we were doing was unproductive or counterproductive. And um, and yet there was such an esprit de corps and such a good community, a really good community of people um, that we would kind of be like cops, we would kind of not call BS on each other. And we would, and, um, and we would, you know, in the interest of kind of building a community and experimenting with this, building the techniques and discovering how to do this stuff, um, we weren't as efficient as possible. We, I don't think we can do that anymore. I think that we, we need to be putting our time and our efforts into those things that are really impactful. We need to go and pull the ice plant from a, from a marsh where you can actually eradicate the ice plant and save a rare cordylanthus. There's plenty of that kind of work, and 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 I and I do think that on the collecting side, you know, I'm as you hear, I'm a I'm pretty committed to providing support to collections and collectors to secure specimens and make sure that they're in revamped, durable collections uh, to be protected in perpetuity. And I and I think that that work 
and the work collecting local native plant seeds um, is stuff that if we can build the systems and the structures to empower volunteers and community members to do that, we can get a huge amount of good work done. And so we don't have to say, you know, end the volunteer programs. We're not pulling, you know, we're not whacking useless weed patches anymore. Um, an another example is whacking the French broom patch in pitcher in, in, um, in one of the canyons at Bolinas Lagoon Preserve. Um, we don't have to say that we're not gonna, you know, we don't have to end the programs if we build systems that empower people to be able to go out to local populations and collect seeds and then archive them both for in perpetuity but then also as part of a restoration seed bank i think we can get more people involved and i feel like that is the kind of work that is uh, more valuable than some of the stuff that i confess to having done back in my day thanks sherry adams great hi, sherry. hi dan great question terry i love the how do we make sure we're doing the important work? That's um, that's a great stuff. Um, hi, Dan. It's always great to hear what you're up to and to be inspired by it. Um, I want to ask you to go back to where you start. I do remember that French broom patch. I want to ask yeah. you to go back to where it's you're still there. <laughs> <laughs> In the air harder too. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, go back to where you started, if you would, talking about seed collection. I think at MMWD, we've given out maybe four permits to the some of the folks who are collecting seeds. So I have a little bit of familiarity with some of the on the ground um, work that's going on. Um, it's awesome to hear from all these different folks who are dedicated to it. Um, and um, something I know you're really good at is, you know, the ult ultimately a visionary is about, about giving us the vision, like paint the picture for us. So help me to get um, by by giving me, I, I love thinking um, in scales that I can actually visually personally see. And I love stepwise thinking so that I kind of get the steps to where you're going. So even if it's not exactly how it will go, can you can you paint a picture of a, some of the ways which seed banked seeds might be used? Um, for example, for a species that's gone extinct or maybe that hasn't, or even an insect collection that represents the huge amount of diversity that we currently have still how, what what might it look like inspire us more um on a on a smaller scale if you would okay yeah um uh trying to get stepwise here and non-chaotic uh, which is hard for me um so for for plants i guess because plants are kind of dual purpose we're we're you know we're actively introduced we're actively propagating plants and so seed banks mean different things to different people there's um, and, and, and including, yeah. And so um, there's, there's restoration seed banks and, and you know, active seed banks in which we're, we're collecting material with the intent of propagating it. And then there's kind of more like doomsday vault type seed banks where we're collecting the material just to secure it, just so that it's there for the future. Uh, so that future generations will, will have access to those plants um, even when they're gone in the field. And we'll have access to the, the DNA that provides, you know, the secrets for how to survive on that piece of soil. Um, and so just to get that out of the way, I think the real, the real value on, you know, on, for, the, for the doomsday vault seed banks, um, uh, the value there is that we're securing biodiversity for the future that they won't have access to unless we collect it and, and save it now. Um, and that's not just, you know, the DNA sequences, but, you know, the stable isotopes that are in there that tell them what the climate was like and the, and the variation within and among populations that tell them how the oak trees migrated during past periods of climate change, all kinds of information that is embedded in those specimens. Um, and so for me, that's the, you know, that's a fundamentally important. And it's, it's cheap. After my dad died, I cleared out all the stuff into a storage unit and I pay 84 bucks a month for this, you know, cubified dadness. And, um, and someday I'll sort through it. And someday our descendants will sort through what we collect today. But in the meantime, we're capable of storing stuff cheap. And if that's all you're doing, it's very inexpensive. Active collections are much more expensive. If there's folks doing work on them to pull seeds out and do germination experiments and test how different storage conditions affect viability and all that kind of stuff, that's expensive. You got PhDs, you got labs, you got all that kind of stuff. Same thing if you're using the seeds for restoration um, or, or for landscaping or whatever it might be. Um, ultimately, I think that, you know, for example, for plants, 
I think we can develop a distributed statewide seed bank for plants that provides local material locally um, for all the restoration projects that are going to be coming down the pipeline, you know, with these billions of dollars and everything else. Um, and that looks like um, a combination of simply supporting existing businesses that are making collections, um, increasing the seeds, storing them in a barn under uncontrolled climate, and letting the seeds die, and then unfortunately throwing them away when they're when they're done. Um, we can we can bring those together, um, bring together a single database of what they have, where they were collected, um, take accessions of those, and store them under under cold conditions, not not long term storage conditions necessarily, but the kind of refrigerated conditions that will extend the the shelf life of hedgerow seeds from one year to eight years. Um, in, in doing that, we can build substantially greater availability of material for restoration while also doing a better job of tracking what we have and where it's from and making sure that it goes back to the right places. At CMPS, we did this with the Rio project where we collected, we got people to send us acorns from all over California and then we tracked the, the sources of those. And when we sent the acorns and seedlings back out, they went back out to the same locations. So we showed that it can be done at scale. And if we have an integrated system that does it at scale, um, you could see it integrating with something like CNPS chapters where people are have access to private lands and public lands to be able to collect seeds from, from common plants as well as- I can't you know, get any uh, audio. Uh, am I muted? Yeah. Uh, okay, Robert, sorry. And, um, and, and, the, and I can see those dovetailing together so that we're getting local seed collection from, from volunteers um, that are contributing to, to an, a growing statewide seed bank. And you know that statewide seed bank looks like a basic matrix species by location, and where each of those intersect, you got a square. And the square, you know, you type in what seed, who has the seeds from for that for that intersection, and 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 um, and you can overlay it with um, proposed large scale projects. You know, Caltrans's freeway expansion where they're required to plant native plants eight years from now. And you can identify urgent needs to actually go out and actively secure material from sites you know you're going to need seed from in the future. So I think I think a system like that is basically just a planning system. It's fundamentally fairly inexpensive to a large degree. It leverages the seed collections and growing and propagation that the industry is already doing. Um, if you add in what volunteers are able to do, then you've got something really incredible that I think can save us from homogenizing our flora. Thanks, Dan. Tom Conlon. Thanks, Dan. Um, this is kind of fun for me, different from my normal meetings. Um, I'm curious, you mentioned the, the army of chainsaw wielding uh, recruits that are out there right now. And I'm wondering if you've been, if you can comment a little bit more on the way the state is responding to the fire crisis and the effects that that is having on our natural lands. Um, I'm, I'm particularly concerned about the, uh, what's going on at the Air Resources Board right now. They're talking about um, using biomass as a major way of getting us to zero carbon emissions. And uh, that looks like it's going to take the form of harvesting lots and lots of biomass, and it's going to have impacts on natural land. So I'm curious you to speak about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, there's $150 million in there for net zero biomass utilization. Um, and it's kind of what you described. Um, there's folks who think it's a real proposal, you know, uh, advocate for it as, you know, funding, funding fuel management while also providing jobs in rural communities. Um, I think it's complicated and messy. Um, I, I fear that, you know, once you, you know, once you built the power plants, for example, if that's what it is, um, or the, or the press board manufacturing plants um, out in a rural community that, uh, in, in a worst case scenario, you're building facilities in a community that is doomed to burn down every 10 years anyway. Um, and you're, you're boosting a population that to a large degree right now, may be aging retirees who are happy to move down to Chico close to the hospital. Um, and, um, and, and so there's definitely potential for downside. Obviously there's good stuff that can be done about it. To be honest, it's a, it's a, it's a big, big locomotive that's moving. Um, I, I pay attention to fire stuff and to water stuff. Um, but, but those are, those are, uh, 
but I really put my time and effort into the low hanging things where I feel like um, a little bit of work can have very high leverage. And in biodiversity, um, that means, you know, a focus on biodiversity, creatures, individuals, specimens, um, good maps of what we've got and where we've got it, which we just don't know now. The kind of stuff that all of us can do, you know, we can put a few hours in outside and we've, and we've moved the needle. Um, so, so the big stuff, um, I pay attention to it. It makes me depressed. It makes me very worried. Um, I would encourage folks to, um, uh, you know, one, one, for, I think we can draw some lines on fire. I think we need to have general rules of thumb, such as chaparral, no. Um, to my mind, um, chaparral, you know, it's, as someone who grew up in chaparral, um, is simply not habitable. Uh, we don't build houses in, in storage yards of, of gasoline drums and we shouldn't build them in chaparral. It's the fricking same thing, it's like the same fuel load. Um, and, um, and, we, and we've got good evidence that, you know, sites will burn every year, every three years with the same intensity. You'll, you'll have world record fires, you know, at three year intervals. Um, chaparral is, is, is not conducive. You know, you can't, you can't live in it. Um, and you can't manage it unless you type convert it to grass, which will burn every year and be less catastrophic, but you know, a problem. So I think we can come up with rules of thumb like that. Like no depopulate chaparral. Um, do not put money into, into masticating and control burning chaparral. Um, of course, when I, you know, just it's, we, we all we all need to come together and say that together and very loudly for it to be heard because we're um, there's a you know there's a big fire industrial complex that um, that's moving forward with or without us. Uh, Paul De Silva. Yes, thank you so much, Dan, for all of your heavy lifting in the legislature at a key time that's produced so many wonderful benefits. So thanks so much, and because of your experience. I just wanted to run something by you that uh, some of my native California friends talk about. And this is uh, maybe expanding uh, ethnic studies to include other species. Is anybody in the legislature receptive to that or is, is that just still too far out for them? Oh, I don't know, that's interesting. Uh, what if, yeah, I don't know, man. Um... <laughs> Well, because that's what we're, we're really talking about this as, as, a, as a problem that's come from people not understanding our, 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 our local flora and fauna the way that you know, many native peoples have over from time, you know, immemorial. And, and we're noticing in our society right now, that we have these multiple crises and they're connected. So we're coming to a recognition of the, a lot of the work that has to be done um, in uh, facing uh, racial inequities and fa facing a lot of these, these problems that have been ignored for too long. And, and it seems to me that the, the, the lack of, of appreciation of our, of our uh, other fellow species here is, is right along those same lines. And if a little bit of money could be put, could be put into education, starting you know, very, very at an early age in the schools, you know, that would really transform uh, a lot of things in our society with respect to our our, uh, our whole biodiversity. Yeah, well, um, you know, I'm, I apologize. I think I might have used up all my brain glucose. I'm having a hard time kind of getting my head around this. Um, and forgive me if I'm off, you know, if I, uh, my initial response in that is that they're really, you know, very different things. Um, and, and, you know, and, and, and all of the above. Yes, we need to make sure that people know more about nature and know more about species. Um, but I don't think that's the most important thing. I, th I think, um, and, and because we don't need everyone to, you know, we don't need it, everyone to be like us and know all the plants in their neighborhood. The diversity of, of viewpoints and understandings is important. We just need a simple majority of the people who turn out to vote to vote for our stuff. And they don't have to know, they don't have to be able to ID their butterflies to do that. Um, they already are there. And so I think to a certain degree, um, it's not about, I mean, to a very large degree, it's not about us figuring out how to teach people stuff better. It's about us listening a little bit more. Um, and as far as, yeah. I think the next- Oh, and then I should say on the, on the legislative stuff, I wanna give props to Steve Shanig. Um, when I was president of Calypsi, he was a big advocate 
for advocating in front of government. Um, and we went to DC together to lobby for more funding for weed management areas. And we, and we lobbied in Sacramento and he kept making the case. Um, he was kept pushing for, for Cal Ipsy at that time to put more general fund money into legislative advocacy. And, and, um, and it, 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 you know, it took a while for, I think, for that message to be heard, but I heard it loud and clear. And there's definitely a ton of opportunity there, not just because you can secure a little bit of funding to seed bank all of California's rare plants. Can we stop for a moment there that we are ending extinction of rare plants in California uh, for $3.6 million. And, and, you know, a lot of hard work by a lot of smart people. Um, but also because in the process of doing that, you've educated the legislators and you've made connections so that they, they can make better decisions when it comes to managing chaparral. And they can get, you know, they can get that organization on the phone when they have legislation in front of them that pertains to it. Uh, so the legislative advocacy is really powerful. And uh, yeah. We have, I guess, time for one more question. So Leslie uh, Saul Gershens. Yeah, well, a couple of points. Dan was talking about the importance of uh, making collections of plants. And of course, it's important to make collections of insects too, um, whether it's pollinators or all insects, um, because we need to know one, what's there and where they are. Um, because um, uh, if we don't know where they are, where they were, uh, it, which we do by inventorying an area, um, if they're missing, we don't know if they were there, if they should be there, if an area is destroyed, say by a solar facility, which they destroy thousands and thousands of acres. We don't know if it's because the climate has changed or they've just obliterated the entire ecosystem. And so it's important that we have um, specimens and their locations and their, the species um, community that they're in. So um, we know what's going on um, for now and for the future. So having those uh, specimens are so critically important. Um, so just for the plants, as well as the insects, pollinators, but also the other uh, insects that interact with the plants are important as well, because everything kind of comes together. Um, as a chemical ecologist, it, you know, it's more complex than just, uh, you know, bees, it's butterflies and moss and other things too even though I study bees, but- um, and so I, I, I wanna say, Leslie, thank you. So people may not know that Leslie uh, did major bee collections on some of those solar projects that she's talking about. There are, there are probably taxa that someday will only exist in collections that she made. So thank you. And I, yeah. I forgot, I, I know I'd, we're running out of time, but Mia Monroe had had a, a request for me to talk about the Monarch Head Start project. And um, if I can go real fast, the basic deal there is that there's the Western Migratory Monarch and, and the Eastern Monarch. Um, and putting the Eastern aside for now, we've got, um, in California, we've got an emergence of kind of, um, we've got resident, we've got, California has always had the, the Western Migratory Monarch, which has, you know, spread out across North America and then migrated to California, kind of an intergenerational thing um, across the Central Valley twice a year um, to, to find winter habitat on the coast where it can survive and then spread out across North America again. Um, that, mo that monarchs have been declining precipitously and they've declined below the point where they're, they're sustainable, except for resident monarchs, which is a new weird thing. We're getting monarchs that are staying put, um, potentially, you know, because things are warmer, because the milkweed is staying green longer and there's more of it, um, is complicated. Um, are they even really monarchs? Their wing morphology is changing substantially and their metabolism is changing a lot so that they cannot migrate. They don't have the oomph to be able to, to, to bless the rest of the Western United States with their presence. Um, at the same time, you know, the migrants are disappearing um, from millions to 35,000 to this last winter, 2,000, well below the 30,000 threshold. And so we've got a couple of questions. One is, Will there be any migratory monarchs this winter? Are they extinct? Is the migration extinct? And then the other question is, if, they're, if it's not extinct, what can we do right now to save it? And I think that's a question that we all need to be focusing on. Um, there's one solution out there, not the only one, hopefully, uh, but it seems like a good one that Stu Weiss has put together, which is to basically do what we did with condors. If there are any migrants left at overwintering sites this winter, catch some 
and raise them in highly controlled breeding facilities using careful protocols, not people raising monarchs in their kitchen, not putting them on plants in their yard so they get OE and other diseases, not all this stuff that everybody's doing all the time, but doing something really carefully, extremely highly regulated, growing them under external outside conditions so they get the right environmental cues, releasing them very early on at very young stages so that they're in captivity as little as possible. And then, you know, and then releasing them basically so that, um, so that at this point they can't make it across the Central Valley twice. Um, there's just too many pesticides and we need, to, we need to help them a little bit for as long as we want to have them potentially, at least until we fix the pesticide and some other problems. And so this winter is the crux and it's coming on us very fast. And so that's a project that CIB is helping to support uh, that Stu Weiss has come up with. And if you want more info on that or anything else, um, I'm Daniel at calalive.org and we got a website where you can, you know, join or whatever. And this, this has been great. We could, we could probably spend the rest of the night going on this, but uh, unfortunately we do have to come to an end at this point. I just wanted to uh, thank you again for a fabulous talk. Uh, to let you know what will be next month on the 11th, the second Monday, it will be uh, Nicole Ibanez. Uh, we uh, actually, the chapter provided a scholarship to her a few years back uh, for her research. And she's gonna be talking about that, which is climate as a driver of divergence in soil specialist plants. So come uh, and hear a little about uh, evolution in our, uh, in our own turf. Uh, so with that, I want to wish you uh, a, a good evening, and we hope to see you uh, see you next month. Thanks again. Thanks.